So you can kind of watch it and watch your own cast and, and learn from um, seeing something go wrong. That's the idea. Spay casting evolved in Scotland in some, somewhere in 1800s, a long time ago, in, in a river in Scotland called the Spay. That's where the name came from. And the beautiful thing about spay casting is it's a long, old, traditional sport with lots of classical things, moves, and, and history and, and traditions. I respect traditions. One of the traditions of the spay fishermen is that you always bless the water. With a little single malt. And you bless the people you fish with and the fish. And I always start my presentations with a little blessing like that. Just a, you know, just a little slurp of whiskey. And one more. And I know that... Uh, doesn't mean much to you over here, but to the Queen of England, who died unfortunately, so a little toast to her. Oh, here, that feels good. And if anyone wants to know what this is, this is a, a Glenrothes, very fine whiskey, with one of the finest salmon pools in Scotland, right by the distance. I can't even shut it now. So, on with the game. We are much better now. All right, spay casting. So these are two-handed rods, right? Double-handed rods, two-handed rods, spay rods, trap spay rods, switch rods. What a lot of names. Very, very confusing when you get into this world. Uh, if you're new at it, it's very confusing because they have all these names. And to just make, simplify the game and, and kind of terminology, this is a two-handed rod, right? You've got an upper grip that's long and a little bottom grip here that you're gonna hold it with two hands. You should hold the bottom grip below the reel, not up here. You may laugh, I've seen a lot of people do that. Hold it down here. Anything under 12 foot is generally considered a switch rod. Was considered a switch rod, like terminology. Spay rods and switch rods. Spay rods were long two-handed rods, 12 feet and up. And switch rods were two-handed rods, 12 foot and down. Just kind of generalizing it. And then this, this trout spay thing came into the terminology. And trout spay are these switch rods, so under 12 feet, but in really light line sizes. One weights two weights and three weights and four weights maybe maybe a five five is mega ones and twos are great this is a three that's a one and just to, for those who are new at this game to correlate that with your one-handed rods roughly speaking add the number three this is a three rod three weight trout spay three plus three is six so this is like a six weight one-hander i could take my six weight one-handed rod take the line off that put it on here and it's pretty right balance so use that as a kind of a, a thought process if you're going to buy a trout spay rod and you want to get into trout spay fishing. That's one way of kind of determining what size rod you like. If you love four weights and fishing light little flies, four minus three is one. Take a one weight. Right? That's, don't get a five weight necessarily just because you fish a five weight one handed rod. They are not the same beast. So that's kind of a little starting thing to think about. Another little thing to think about is this. See where my, this rod balances? It balances right on that little finger there. If you hold the balance point of a two-handed rod, it's pretty easy to move that rod. Very, very easy. So when you set yourself up with a trout spay outfit, make sure you have a reel heavy enough to balance the rod where you like to hold it. Really easy to move that rod here. You fight pretty hard if you don't hold the balance point. So you're having to do a lot of work. And then on here, I've got what's called a Scandi head. I'm not going to talk about the terminology. There's some amazing presentations coming up. and going to go into fishing techniques and different types of lines and things like that. This is what's called a Scandi type line. There's a Skagit type line. There's a Scandi type line. Essentially, those are the two type of designs that most trout spay anglers, most spay anglers use or utilize these days. Um, Scandies are, you can see this little blue outside the rod here. If you're getting into this game and if you've seen the curriculum, when I finish my presentation, which you know, half an hour, whatever it is, it's an open water. So you've got about an hour before the next presentation to be Eric, which means grab a rod and get down and cast. And people like 
myself, there's lots of people walking around and helping out with casting lessons or giving you some tips. So if you want to give this a go and you've never done it, grab a rod, it's a perfect opportunity to do so. Um, and so if you are new to this, what you want to make sure is this has got a shooting head, you can see the dark blue. So with this head, I want to make sure the blue is roughly around at the top of the rod. The fact is part of this fly line is right back here, right at the back of it. Almost every spay line design is going to most way to the back. Not at the front. A lot of one-handed lines are way to the front. The reason, very simple, when you make a spay cast, what a spay cast is, a spay cast is basically glorified roll cast. It comes from, from the roll cast. I, I like to say that the roll cast is, is the grandpa of spay family. So all the spay family came from a roll cast. So if you could do a really good roll cast, you're pretty well on your way to doing a good spay cast, to understanding the concept of a good spay cast. And the thing about a roll cast is the only thing that really loads your rod is this little bit of line hanging down from you. It was called a D loop. So when we when the lines are designed for spay casting and roll casting, this has got to be the heaviest part. That's the part that's going to load the rod. So most spay lines are going to have a weight at the back and get lighter and lighter towards the front. And most, not most, but most of the best selling trout lines, regular trout lines, actually have weight at the front because now, if you think about regular trout fishing, and you're doing an overhead cast and you're stripping a streamer or you're on a lake and fishing whatever, you're fishing dry fly upstream, you strip the line in. Generally speaking, if your line is heavy at the front end, when you start your regular casting, you know, that heavy weight pulls the line out, makes it easier to shoot. So the majority of trout lines are more front loaded, the majority of A lines are rear loaded. Okay, so enough a little bit about gear. Just a couple of things about the roll cast. What, what I'd like to do is just start off uh, again. If you've seen these before, I apologize because these are I'm just doing real raw basics, especially for those new people here. Um, if anyone wants to look at some more advanced stuff, very happy to work with you up the river, down the river later on. But just going to run through the real simple basics of what these trap bait casting is about. As I said, this thing's called the D loop. That's what's going to make my rod. So, what, one of the first things you need to do with a roll cast, make sure that you create a deal right, right now the deal in front of the rod is not going to make a good cast right the rod didn't bend against that so first thing i want to do with my roll cast is i just want to tilt that rod back make sure there's a bit more deal a bit more line behind the rod now i've got a little bit of weight the rod will load against that right so i've, I've created the deal the deal is an absolutely essential part of this spade cast all spade casts will have some kind of deal and as you get better at spade casting, you control that deal. Sometimes you are so tight to obstructions, there's a wall of trees behind you, you want to make sure you have a really tiny deal, kind of right by your shoulder, not like that, right by your shoulder, and then sometimes you have a bit more space and you have a bigger deal. Because the bigger that deal loop is, the more load the rod is going to get, and the less effort you have as a caster. So the deal loops are friend. He's your big buddy you take him to the bar on a Friday night. He's your friend. The bigger he is, the better the cast will be. So that right, that's one thing about the D-loop. And then another little thing. Um, the opposite of the D-loop is the line is lying on the water. That's called the anchor, the stick. It, you know, there's a lot of terminology, but there's a grip. There's a bit of line on the water, and there's a bit of line in the air. And the line hanging down with the rod is the D-loop. The line on the water we're going to call is the anchor. That's the terminology. And one of the th cruxes of that Perhaps one of the, the subtlest things to spot, especially if you're new to this, is a thing called point P. And point P, I don't know if you guys can see it all up there. Point P is a term for this piece of fly line that touches the water. So if you look at the line curving down there, there's a little tiny ripple where it touches the water. And that ripple thing is called point P. Can you guys see it up there or is it hidden by the bank? Well, you just trust me. I'm a doctor. Um, I would wade out and drown, but I'm not going to. One thing about point P, what I like about point P, is that if, you, if you're making roll cast, just your humble roll cast, try and keep that little bit of line, that wave, that ripple, that point P, that whatever you want to call it, make sure it's in front of you when you start your forward cast. Because when you do, if as long as that point P is in front of you, when you start the forward cast, what you'll hear on the forward stroke is noise from your fly line. If point P is behind you marginally, when you go forward, 
Yeah, that's spray noise. You might not be able to hear it up there. Okay, trust me, if you can't hear it. And it, the further back point is behind you, the more that spray noise there is. So when you hear that on your forward stroke, that's not a good sound. That's not the sound of a good cast. That is all your energy being sucked out by that grip on the water. And that's because this point P thing went behind you for whatever reason. There's loads of reasons. Yeah, and you can be hasty. You can pivot and drop your rod. You can have too quick a stroke. There's lots of reasons, but just don't have point P behind you. Don't be hasty, true beer. Well, that comes from. So you want to have a line hanging down. Look at point P where it is. And then you'll have these nice quiet casts that leave the water without any noise. And those are the ones you really want to practice on your roll cast. And then the last little thing about the roll cast, and this is where, I think this is, to me, this is the interesting part. This is where Spade got, got born, if you like. How did, a, how did the roll cast, how did Grandpa roll cast create so many kids? Single Spade, double Spade, snake roll, snap key, peri poke, wombat, ooslem, jelly roll. God, there's a lot of these things. How did these all spawn from a roll cast? Well, let me show you. First thing about that is, is again, for beginners, there's a, there's a little term in the spade casting. It could be the train tracks, it could be the rail tracks, it could be the parallel line, the ladder. I don't care what you call it. But imagine two lines that are parallel, like a train track. Good name. And one of those lines, a supply line is lying on the water, right there. And the second line is where you aim your forward stroke, parallel to that line. Does that make sense? Right, you've got two lines, one there, one there. Those are parallel. That's good. So that will always be a good roll cast. That will always be a good roll cast. I see my lines facing down there. Make my forward stroke down there, and I'll have a good roll cast because I follow that kind of line. You're a busy man, Matt. I'm trying to get this work. You're made out of love. Maybe the plastic <laughs> Maybe I'll just cast on the grass. Maybe I need to turn and face this. Maybe should I put it out on my back? I don't know. Yeah, put it in the back. Do you think it would? What's going on? What if I drop it in the river? Oh, how's that sound? Is that it, man? Yeah. Oh, how do we start with that? Oh, I the first that one out. Oh, shit, I can't turn. All right. I have to let me back. All right, this is why they put me up first, to find out all the problems, obviously. Uh, anyway, so the train track things are quite a nice theory, right? You've got a line facing this way. If you follow that line, you're going to get a good forward stroke. And the things you don't want to do, there's two things you don't want to do. You don't want to cross the line. Right, here's my line facing down there. I don't want to cross that train track. You imagine there's a train track going like in Europe and your, your train is going from London to Edinburgh. And you go down and get on the train to Edinburgh and off you go. And what you don't want to do, you don't want to be an eight year old kid crossing that train track when the train comes along. If you cross over this line, you're going to tangle. Right, so people do. And so they do this beautiful roll cast, they drag the line back, and they look at point P, and they form a D loop, and go, oh, here's my line, and they pop it down there, and go, oh, look at that beautiful cast. I'm gonna do another one. You come back, and you lift it up, and you go, oh, here's my line down here, and here's my D loop, and here's my point P, and look at that cast. And all you're doing is putting the line back in the same place, repetitively. Great for casting, and your ego goes better because you're casting nicely. But there's, in the meantime, there's a pile of fish that's rolling and swirling around here. You want to catch those. So what turns a roll cast into a spay cast is simply the act of moving the train track from where it was to where you want to go. Usually a train conversation in Europe. You're in London, you want to go to Milan. You get on the train that says Milan. Don't get on the train that says Paris. If Milan is over there and London's here and Paris is there and Stockholm is here, right? Imagine destinations. If I start my line and I flop my line over here to Milan, when I come back, my train track is in that direction. So what a spay cast, essentially what a spay cast is, is a way you move the track to where you want to go. 
Milan. There it is, look, it's facing Milan. Off I go. And if I move the train track like this, it's facing, was that Paris? I think it was Paris. It's facing Paris. That's where I make my point. So does that make sense, right? You, so the simplest form of spake casting, how spake casting evolved was really no more than having a move, move the track got the line in alignment with where you want to go and then you finish off with a glorified roll cast and that's what a spay is. So when you break down oh, those spays, I'm going to just show you kind of the four common spay casts and I'll pause. And imagine that every one of these I want to go to Milan. So my line starts here in London and I'm going to do a thing called a single spay. This is a single spay. If I pause, you can see my track is facing Milan, right? Here's a cast called a snap T. If I pause, there's the track facing Milan. Here's a cast called a snake roll. Facing Milan, right? Do you get the idea? So all the casts are, are just different ways of you moving the line from where it started to actually where you want to go. And the crux of that, it may be a flippant turn, but the crux of that is you you have to have this this motto, all of you here. So now embrace this motto, and that motto is, I will never, ever make a bad spake cast. And you have this this hat. I actually need to make these hats. Spay ambassador. I want to be a spay ambassador. I want to be that person out there that's fishing a pool up there 150 yards away and making these cards. And somebody sees me and they come up and say, wow, what is that beautiful thing? Oh, it's a spay cast. Well, show me. Oh, I think I have a spay ambassador. Good. Well, the only way you can do that is if you live by this rule. You never make a bad spay cast. And that's, that's it. It might be a flippant rule, but it's pretty easy to live by because you've got to remember to always follow that track. Wherever it is, wherever that train's going, you, you're on it. And what I mean by that is when you're learning and you're really new to the trap spay game, you aren't going to actually put the track where you want it. You land somewhere. So follow it. Right? You might get up here and you, you have some lessons in the morning and somebody shows you this beautiful car, it's got a snap tee, and you go, oh, I'm going to something like this. And you pause and go, where, where's... Find your track. Right? What I mean by that, I'm going to do it on the left-hand one because I've got some slower water here to show you. If I do a car, it's called a snake roll and I'm aiming at Milan, I want to aim at Milan, and I do something like this. That track is not facing Milan, that's facing Paris. So I'm going there. I'm not going to where I wanted to go. That's what you've got to do. You've got to have that discipline to understand that wherever your line is facing, your best cast will be where you make that forward stroke parallel to that. Don't break that rule. Right? If I do that same move again and make a forward stroke over here, look what happens. Not on a good cast. Do the same cast, but make the right forward stroke. Yeah, good. So whatever these moves you do, just just give yourself a, a little, little bit of time. Sorry, I got a face man. Yeah. Give yourself a little time to understand where's that line facing, and follow it. So that's kind of the simplicity. And really, if you're if you're learning, the original spay cast. When you read the old books that talked about spay casting, the term spay casting didn't evolve for more than 50 years after the spay cast was actually discussed and taught. There was no term spay cast in the early days. But the earliest spay cast description I've ever found, to paraphrase, said something like this. You're fishing a river. You want to cast your line across the river. You bring your rod into the bank behind you with a nice low sweep. With an almighty great heave, you heave the line across the river. And then you drag the rod back with a great wallop. You smash it across the river. So it's kind of like that. I call that the crude spay. And again, if you think of what this, the, the description is doing, it is flopping the line here and then finishing off by straightening it on the forward track. That's what that description basically means. And this is, I, can't, I liken spay casting to uh, ice skating. Uh, you watch a bit of ice skating because it's amazing what these people can do. And the commentator says, oh, that's a triple salco, Fal falco, whatever it is. And then he, the skater does a, another thing. Oh, that's a triple total. Oh, great. Uh, and then there's a triple flip, triple lutz. Right? 
What? What is? How do you know? Spay casting kind of the same. We have a double spay and a single spay and a snap tee and a snake row and as I said, all these cars. And really, all of them are just ways of moving that train track. And you make your own up, right? You can, you can, you can be walking down the river. You've got a nice steep bank here and a bit of slippery weed. And you're walking down and you kind of slip. And you go, oh, look, I'll move my train track. And you follow it. And you created some kind of spay cast, right? You uh, slip spay or whatever it's called. Again, learning these things, what's really important is, is, is just have fun. Just move the line. And if you don't move the line, guess what you do? Let's say I do something like this. I didn't move the line. To make a good spay cast, where am I going to aim now? Just give me a rough idea. Where should I aim? Yeah. Good. Right there, right where the track is. So just always follow it, right? Wherever it lands, just follow that thing. And as you get into the skating thing and you want to do a triple toe loop because somebody's watching and say, oh, can you do a double spay? Oh, yeah, I can do that. Then you kind of understand the moves that make it a double spay. That's two moves. It's a double spay. It's one move. It's a single spay. Right? You, you start to dial down the specific moves that make it a specific cast. But not when you're learning. When you're learning, have fun. Try and just make a good spay cast. Try and earn your spay ambassador hat by never making a bad spay cast. Flip line, flop line, drag line, snap line, sweep line, curl line. I don't care what you do with your line. But when you've done whatever your moves are, get into the key position and make a good roll cast and you earn your spay ambassador. So if you're completely new to it and you haven't given this game a go before, that's what I would encourage you to do this next session. Grab a rod and fart around with it to see what happens with the line and if you have spay cast and you want to go into more detailed spay cast obviously there's things you can learn and, and improve on so as i said at the beginning i'm just going to run through some of the more common mistakes does anyone have any questions by the way on the real raw basics i, I dumbed it down to like probably the lowest level because i think that's a good place to start this whole day off there's going to be better casters better presentations and better things to come no questions on the basics Okay, so what other what things can go wrong? Well, I'm a great believer in trying to identify your mistake by seeing something. And I'm going to do a couple of forward casts. This is a spay cast called a switch cast. I'm just going to do a couple of switch casts here. If you're getting into the spay game where you are really enjoying your spay casting and you know the names, a switch cast is one of the best foundation builders you can have it's an amazingly good way of building a rhythm of spay casting you can just pick it up put it down because a general spay cast when you make a general spay cast your line goes out across the river and you kind of fish it around you're trying to catch a fish it's swinging i'm not doing any rhythm here there's no rhythm on my spay casting i'm kind of waiting for a fish to come in once it's swung round, I'm going to do some kind of spay cast again. I don't, I'm not, I'm not, I, there's no rhythm. So this, this little switch cast is a great rhythm builder. You can just pick it up and pop it down. Pick it up and pop it down. Just keep going with the spay cast. Building that rhythm. But on any spay cast, have a little look at the forward loop. I'm just going to show you a couple of different things. A couple of common mistakes. The first common mistake... I'll do three of these switch casts and look at the third forward loop, how it differs from the first two. Okay, so here's number one. And here's number two. Here's number three. See how that climbed and fell in a big mess? All right, that's a pretty common mistake. That can happen on a snap tee, it can happen on any spay cast where the climb and f falls down, right? So I see that a lot. I see a lot of loops going up high and fluttering down on any spay cast, and that is almost always caused by a fast start to your forward stroke. Too fast to start. There's four letters in a beautiful spay cast. SS, FM. Start slow, finish fast. Show you that roll cast. Look how slow my rod starts. But then it finishes with the speed. I start slow. Nice drag, key position. This is called the key position. Slow, 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 quick. All right, now, if you watch that loop again, same roll cast. 
I get a nice loop that unrolls just above the water and lands. Now I'll start fast. And there's that line goes up. So if you, if you see that in your buddy, because you would never do it, but if you see that in your buddy, and you see that line climbing, floating back like that, almost invariably they've just started the forward turn way too hastily. Snap T again. Let me watch, I want you to watch that forward cast. You see how fast I started? So now I'll do a good snap T without that horrible loop. I slow into it, then I speed up. So watch your front loop. That one was going up. Now this one's gonna go down. This is horrible. Hard to correct if you do this one. So here's, here's your three switch cars. One, two, three. See how that nose dive down? And there's quite a few causes. The commonest cause is a thing called creep. Creep. Even sounds bad. Well, let's just show you what creep is. When you do a back cast and you come into your key position, you're ready for a forward stroke. That rod should be motionless. And then you start your forward stroke, fast or slow? Thank you. Slow, yes. Then you start your forward stroke. Finish this beat. Key word there I used was the word locked. Zip, zip, locked. And then forward stroke. Creep is kind of a little nervous anticipation. Maybe it's a little excitement. Maybe it's just bad technique. I don't know what it is. But anyway, creep is where you are in the position, but as you're waiting for your D-loop to come and land, you're kind of creeping into the stroke. So, that's a good one. Now here's the creep. Could you see the creep? That rod sneaking forward slightly. All right. I'll show you that in the cast. Again, we do those three switch casts that I was showing you to start with. And now you can kind of watch the loop or you can watch my rod. Does it lock or creep? You'll know which one it is. It's going to be the third. It's a giveaway. I'm telling you the answer. But here they are. Locked rod, forward stroke. Locked rod, forward stroke. Creepy rod forward stroke. Now I'm exaggerating the creep. Not many people creep 25 feet. Not many people creep 25 feet. But it's the point is the rod shouldn't creep. Whatever spay cast you make that rod should be locked until you're ready for the forward stroke to start. Locked. Dead still. Don't sneak forward. You little hobbit. Sneaky hobbit. Master hobbits. No sneaking. What else can go wrong? <laughs> Boy, somebody could write a book on it. A lot of things can go wrong in spay casting. And the last one I'm going to talk about, uh, because really, it, I've eaten kind of, I'm, I'm actually taking away your time. It's your casting time now. So sorry about this. But the last one is a thing called a bloody L. It's got a great name. Because you make the cast, and at the end of that cast, you go, oh, bloody L, that was terrible. <laughs> I'm joking. English humour. I talked about the train track, right? The train track going through Milan or Rome. I didn't mention Rome. London. So if you look at my train track right now, it is a beautiful straight thing. Can, can anyone see it up there? Or is it still hidden by the bank? Nancy's... Man, no, no. You should shake your head. All right. Anyway, it's facing that way, and it's nice and straight. It's a lovely straight track. So I can go forward, I can make my forward stroke along that track, and as long as that track is straight, I know where I'm going. Oh, that was loud. Ooh, I'm back. Sometimes you don't have a straight train track. Sometimes you do something wrong. You have a thing called a bloody L. I'm gonna show you that. I'm gonna make this little snap T cast. And I'm gonna pause. Oh, hang on, sorry. And then I'm gonna pause. And the cast will fail because I'm pausing. But I want to point out my track facing those trees, and I'll do two of them. One track will be dead straight to the trees. It's gonna be, oh, it's gonna be here, it's where you're looking. One track will have this L shape. 
at the fly line. Did anyone see that elk? You all see that there? Bloody hell. <laughs> That's not good. I don't know where my train's going. Is it going there or is it going there? I don't know. The worst part about it is when your energy unrolls along the straight line, here's the L, here's the L, and the energy unrolls along this straight line here, and it's going out beautiful. Oh, look at my loop, and you're ready to go, speed ambassador. And then you hit the corner of the L. Your train derails. It's a horror scene. Death. Passengers mutilated. It hit a corner. A train can't go around a corner like that. Nor can you cast. So when you do your spay cast, you, ca you don't want to have an L. Because look, the moment the, the, oh, God damn it. the moment the energy hits the L, it dies. So watch your tracks. When you make those spay casts, whatever you do, they should be dead straight all the way to the fly. Now, different levels, right? It, it, it's going to take you a few years to be a master at spay casting. It's not something that happens in one hour. And the bloody L is a good little example. The smaller the L is, the better your cast will be. Because you will have Ls on some of these waterborne casts. Everyone does when they're learning. And really that's all you want to try and focus on is a really big L like this is very bad. A small L like this kind of goes out, you see, it's kind of forgiving. But again, you've got the spare ambassador hat to earn. You don't get a spare ambassador hat if you're putting L's into your line. You've got to have no L's. And I'm going to run through the cause of that because I've already talked too much. So I just want you to be aware of that. There's lots of problems. Well, I will tell you. I'll very quickly tell you. The commonest cause of a bloody L is called the dreaded dip. Don't you think of these terms are amazing? Bloody L's and dreaded dips and point P's and oh, beautiful terms. And I'll just do it on this this one because this one is the, again is the commonest cause on on casts like a snap T and a double space. So let's run through the commonest one, and not talk about the, the minor ones. When I make the D loop stroke of a double spay or a snap T type cast, if you look at my rod, it's about a foot above the water. I call this one to fourteen. Except this is a little rod, so fourteen isn't going to be reached. But let's just roll with it. My rod's about one foot above the water, and as I sweep round to form a D loop. My rod is now two feet up, and now my rod's about three feet up, and it's about four, and it's about five, and it's about six, and about eight, and ten, and twelve, and oh, it's fourteen. In other words, a really nice, very efficient stroke is this beautiful, steady incline all the way around to your casting, your key position. That's how it should be. And if you do that, it's pretty easy not to have a bloody L. Where the bloody L comes in is the thing called the dreaded dip. Watch my 1 to 14. Ooh. Ooh. Don't like that. My hackle's gone. What the hell? What are you doing dipping? Let me just show you that in the line. And then I'll shut up because I know I've already over-talked. I know it's all your turns. So here's the two casts. Same snap T. And you'll see 1 to 14 on one. And you'll see 1 to 14 with a dip in the other. Watch the L come in. See how that? I just I'll do that one again, so, and I'll talk it through. One, two, three, da da da, up, 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 up. As long as it's climbing around. If you're watching the anchor on the water, now I'll do that cast and pause. If you're watching the anchor on the water, it's pretty straight. But if now I do the dip, I fold an L into my line. Don't dip. There isn't a dip in the double spay or a snap tee on that D loop stroke. It should be just a lovely even rise, 1 to 14. There's a lot of other things that can go wrong, believe it or not. I mean, there are. That's three of them. Maybe that was four of them. I think that was three. Creep, bloody L, and hitting the hard too fast on the forward stroke. Those are three common ones. I said there's lots and lots of others, but I want, you know, this, is a, this is a team event. This is for your turn to get out of the water. 
So, does anyone have any questions before I wrap up? Excellent. Well, it is your turn. So if you want to get out and borrow a rod or try a rod or come and try a cast, go out, spread up. We got, I think Eric's on at 11, so you've got a good 40 minutes to go and cast before any other presentation. So do it. Go and grab some outfits and cast. And people will be walking up and down helping you. And if anyone needs help, pick me, pick it, George, pick Eric, pick anyone. And we'll go and help you. All right? Thank you. Thank you very much.